The show is strictly for educational purposes. The opinions expressed on the show are personal to the individuals appearing in the show and not those of Thinking Tree Ecoholics Private Limited. The show is not intended to offend or defame any individual, entity, caste, community, race or religion or to denigrate any institution, person, living or dead. Listener discretion is strongly advised. Hello and welcome to Ecoholics Thinking Tree series. Today we have with us a famous personality as a professor, Dr. Krishna Kulkarni sir. He is currently a distinguished professor of economics at the Metropolitan State University of Denver, Colorado, United States of America. He has the experience of teaching since 1990, teaching economics. So today we will discuss about the policy prescriptions in response to economic slowdown. We have presented to you a lot of views to this particular point that said about what needs to be done to better handle an economic crisis. Today we analyze the steps that have been taken so far. What the effective? Uh, what were the loopholes, and what can be done as an immediate measure to better handle this pandemic? To begin, sir, uh, we we cannot compare 2020 to any other year because of its extraordinary character. However, the foremost thing to do in the face of an economic crisis is to revive demand. Is a lesson. the world learned from the great depression how far do you think the government policies have been successful in doing that well actually uh, thank you uh, first for inviting me on this forum sanat i think it is a wonderful opportunity uh, to talk to all your members and uh, thanks for having me and i think your question is very relevant how long and how far can we go with the current policy options that Uh, many countries have selected and uh, that includes india and america and uh, europe and the idea is that uh, we will have a, a massively expansionary fiscal policy uh, which means uh, increase the government expenditure uh, in to give some tax breaks yeah in in the us um the government has actually passed on the money back to the people they have actually sent us the checks depending upon the income higher is your income or smaller is your uh, tax uh, check but all these checks have actually arrived to uh, the uh, deposits and the bank accounts of americans so there is a money distribution going on here and um the, and, and going on in a very massive way to just quote some numbers in march uh, the us congress um, authorized the president uh, to uh, spend uh, one time 2.3 trillion dollar and trillion is a thousand billion and th- and one billion is a 10 crore so 10 crores times thousand uh, that's how the trillion is and 2.3 trillion uh, dollars worth were uh, spent in just one bill then there was another bill of 1.6 trillion so all in all in less than one month or so 4 trillion dollars worth uh, income was distributed uh, by the congress and the president to americans and a similar thing was uh, not to this extent nobody has done to this extent but a uh, european um, <clears throat> um the eu did the same thing uh, india has been uh, talking about uh, massive tax cuts and also some incentives um well obviously uh, this type of uh, policy change in a way was required because this was an unprecedented event mm-hmm. has never happened before and nobody really knows what is the right answer for the policy is um but um, but the idea is that if we increase the income of the uh, people they will somehow go and spend that will increase the total demand for goods and services and uh, the aggregate demand will go up and eventually the economies will start coming back uh, to a so called normal because even in india uh, we have 25% unemployment uh, about the same number here in uh, usa uh, and that is a massive unemployment that is a very very big unemployment uh, even in the great depression uh, the the real ebb of uh, great depression was 1933 in us and that unemployment was 24.5% but it took at least 4 years for a uh, us economy to reach to that point it started in 1929 and slowly but surely in 1933 the unemployment became 25% well okay. here with coronavirus 
we reached to a 25% unemployment in less than three months or less than. And uh, that drastic increase in unemployment needed some drastic change in policy. So I think they did a pretty big uh, expenditure increase. Um, that, and to answer your question, yeah, this is not sustainable. I mean, yes. U.S. government spends in the whole year roughly $4 trillion. Uh, this policy change spent $4 trillion in less than two months. So the whole year expenditure was done in just two months. And uh, uh, we, we can talk about economic consequences of that, uh, but it is not sustainable to answer your question. Yes, because it's like a revenue expenditure, not the capital expenditure. We will not get anything fruitful from that. Although, uh, like if we compare uh, two school of thought, ideology according to you, which is more beneficial to countering COVID, the Keynesian school of thought, focus on demand side, the monetarist school of thought led by Milton Friedman, focus towards monetary policy interest rate. So what do you think the current situation school of thought is beneficial to counter COVID? Well, I, I think the mon monetarist thought goes further. It says that money supply should not be increased by a very uh, large number. Yes. And uh, Keynesian thought is obviously you can increase the money supply to lower the interest rate. And as long as the interest rates are not uh, very low, uh, don't hesitate increasing more money. And uh, Keynesian thought is also, of course, to have expansionary fiscal policy because uh, in Keynesian terminology, and I, I just know the whole sentence because I teach it all the time, <laughs> but, but the, the general theory sentence is that a comprehensive socialization of investment is the only means to reach to the approximation of full employment. So if you want a full employment, you need a comprehensive socialization of investment. Government has to socialize the investment activities. Now, um, President Obama, and I know we, we wrote a little article on this, the President Obama was the most Keynesian uh, president the U.S. has ever seen. Uh, well, um, after Corona, uh, that uh, title will be uh, given to President Trump now uh, because he is the one who signed such a massive increase in government expense. So clearly, monetarists are out the window. Monetarists thought is out the window because their um, whole philosophy was to have a more conservatism, have a lower government expenditure, have lower growth in money supply. And uh, neither of those things are happening right now. So uh, forget about monetarism now. I think is, and I, and I will uh, I will also extend the point further uh, that Corona uh, experience has taught us uh, that a pure capitalistic economy now is a distant dream for uh, most of the most of the economies uh, because uh, government interference is very massive now. Very vital, also yes, sir. Indeed. Yeah. So talk about uh, the situation has compelled us to analyze our healthcare infrastructure all over again, uh, like all over country, especially including U.S. as well, India as well. The SWOT analysis by the Niti Aayog in India paints an ugly picture of the doctor to patient ratio in India. However, we see even USA, which has the highest expenditure on healthcare, about 17 percent, is struggling. On the other hand, countries like Singapore which is having 4.4% expenditure of health to GDP. And New Zealand, around 9%, are few of the best performing uh, countries in the fight against COVID. What is your opinion on that? Well, I, actually, uh, COVID has really uh, shown us how deficient we were uh, in the healthcare sector. And I, I think uh, the point, point is well made that we need uh, not just more doctors, but we need nurses, hospitals, uh, equipments, even uh, ex extend that to PPE uh, and uh, uh, personal protection equipment. Uh, but, uh, <clears throat> but the point is, all these things were uh, deficient uh, when the crisis uh, uh, strike, uh, crisis struck. But, but you, you know what, this, this is such a one in a lifetime event, and I, I hope this happens to be only once in a lifetime event in the future also, uh, then um, a, a very large increase in healthcare uh, may be uh, not very productive. Uh, and, and assuming that we get over this by uh, either finding a new vaccine or finding a cure for uh, 
covid patients or a third possibility is that covid just uh, dies of its natural death and just disappears so uh, in few months and then we don't have to really do anything about it it just goes away until of course the next uh, covid uh, instead of covid 19 i don't know what the next name will be but let's say covid 20 <laughs> comes around um so the question is will there be a covid 20 in the future and if the answer is even remotely yes then we better start spending more on healthcare and doctors and and hospitals and almost everything that is needed uh, to get ready for that but the extent of this uh, virus and its ability to get spread so fast so quickly and so widely uh, was mind boggling and i i think nobody no amount of healthcare expenditure would have been ready for this uh, so uh, so i think it is just a shock a very big negative shock and uh, hopefully it doesn't happen again and then you probably don't need a whole lot of expenditure uh, but of course a increase in uh, expenditure on healthcare is is a wise idea is is a good idea but still sir if having the high amount of health expenditure the countries like us and italy are also struggling or has a struggle past 3 to 4 months so what what are sort of points like what are suggestion that we can think about apart from expenditure well as i said we we probably have to have a more elastic supply for these equipments um and by that i mean uh, when the event r- strikes we get to work faster and i think if if we make a elastic supply uh, for uh, these equipments and hospitals i think that well we did come up with all the innovative ideas however um, the convention centers were turned into like in new york uh, the edison uh, square garden was turned into a hospital uh, the hospital ship was brought in there in new york so those are the uh, novel ideas which probably are emergency ideas and i think if something like that happens in the future uh, they they will be ready for it and this readiness probably is more important than the actual expenditure yes indeed since sir we are opening up the economy right now in india as well and some of the stu- uh, us states also not adopted the lockdown strategy how do you see the two different strategy by locking down some sectors or locking down economy or not well the covid virus was such a mysterious virus and it created um, an uncertainty to such a wide extent that policy makers were really confused about this in a way and when you are confused you take some extreme ideas and, and the, one of the extreme ideas was to have a curfew like lockdown and nobody walks around and i know in india um, we saw on social media how uh, police were ruthless uh, on people who were walking around for no reason so um, i I, th- i think that type of response was a number one it was an extreme response and number two it was a response because there was so much uncertainty and uh, uh, ignorance is a harder word uh, but uh, not knowing how this is going to go and how this is going to spread that's why the reaction was there uh, to be honest with you there is nothing else they could have done I mean, yes. if you want to stop the virus of this kind <laughs> what else can you do seriously it was a trade off between economy and the people life so that oh absolutely and i i think that trade off was very clear I means uh, right when uh, the lockdown uh, began uh, i was on uh, tv here in uh, denver colorado and i said the longer we uh, stay in the lockdown worse it will be for the economy and i think we did reach to 25% unemployment right after that um, well, just to give you some statistics uh, the yearly unemployment filing in the state of colorado where i live was no more than 4000 people so only 4000 unemployment benefits were uh, claimed here in a in a week well when the uh, coronavirus uh, struck that figure went up from 4000 to ready 120000 a week and that's how bad uh, the situation was and uh, clearly the lockdown obviously uh, made unemployment go up gdp go down and uh, all kinds of recessionary forces came down here yes also uh, moving towards another important social sector that is educational sector 
uh, with most of the educational institutions shifting their classes to virtual mode we realize that they are way cheaper than the traditional classroom in this context how do you see uh, educational sector after covid well uh, let me be blunt about this i think doesn't matter which angle you look at it the education on zoom and on all kinds of other uh, um web activities that we do is a second best solution for our education delivery and without doubt face to face is what have made generations after generations probably brighter and better suited for economic growth now going to zoom or to a distant delivery is definitely a setback to uh, to teaching now i don't know any professor who has a better uh, efficiency online than on a face to face well right. in my personal case of course i am i am not even half effective on the zoom uh, as i am on the face to face um so let let's not uh, hide from uh, hide from uh, the blame that we will get that education will not be uh, education will not be as good or as efficient in the future be, because that's just a, uh, as i said matter of the fact yes indeed uh, so talking on non essential services and the production that were directly affected by the lockdown which led to a reduction in the number of hours worked job losses among other things of course as you were mentioned how can economy globally come out of this issue what are the probable solution that we have Well, I think well, it's very hard to make forecasts, and and I I shy away from making exact forecasts because I know for sure that uh, whatever forecast I make may or may not come true, and I th- I think it's more may not come true rather than may come true. Means I I you have to be extremely lucky that whatever you say uh, actually happens in the future. Uh, so uh, in fact, though my usual sentence on that is that anybody who tells you that they know exactly what It's going to happen in the future in terms of the timeline. Ah, huh? they are outright lying to you because there is no nobody and uh, yes. really come up with the exact timeline of uh, recovery. But um, but one can one can make some uh, educated uh, guesses, however, and educated guess or the history has always shown us that longer this um, lockdown, opening up uh, slowness. and uh, not coming back to the original activity level uh, the longer it takes worse it gets and i think uh, recovery will be longer uh, if as i said if we don't find a cure fast or if we don't find a um, vaccine for this and if this doesn't go away by by, by itself then uh, we are looking at some uh, harder times for uh, almost all economies uh, and bar none india us europe and uh, everybody else will uh, suffer uh, suffer from that but uh, if you allow me to take a little bit extra time i i think there are two or three theoretical uh, developments that are happening because of uh, corona virus number one is that we are obviously saying goodbye to the traditional uh, free market economy or a pure capitalistic economy where uh, i don't know you are too young uh, to hear a saying but when i was growing up there was a saying that uh, the go- the government that governs least is the most efficient government and and of course that saying is now out the window uh, yes. the governments obviously are acting up very fast and very quickly and a very large number as well so uh, so so government interference so wither pure capitalism that's probably number one lesson corona has uh, given us the second is uh, look how protection is most of the countries are we are not even allowing the international flights as yet um or passenger flights i mean but of course there are some necessary things going on so the uh, the international trade is going to be affected very uh, vastly by all this uh, that uh, the world trade volume is going to shrink uh, next year and a year after and peop- and countries are getting more and more cautious about opening the international trade so the whole argument about uh, free trade uh is necessary and free trade will make the economy and if if we become more and more protectionist 
and be suspicious about each other's uh, products and uh, put more and more restrictions on each other products of course the economic growth is going to be slow mm-hmm. so we if we have a slower economic growth in the future clearly uh, we are not going to go back to the normal or another way to say the same thing is that uh, the new normal is going to be not the old i think we will have a new normal where uh, the trade is blocked uh, government has a uh, very vast influence on the economies and uh, and i think that that is an important point that's that's where we are headed uh, but putting a timeline in this is almost impossible mm-hmm. will but next year two years from now five years from now we don't know all we can do is just these are the trends that we we are seeing uh, thanks to corona yes these days government also are also uncertain about the and they can only plan for next 15 or 30 days so we cannot think about one year or two year term indeed sir mm-hmm. so talking about uh, the protectionist policy uh, see a uh, world trade organization that is having uh, certain norms like most favored nation national treatment now the second principle that is national treatment how do you see the role of world trade organization in this protectionist world Well, I think they have a big, challenging, big and a challenging role. I think uh, World World Trade Organization has to convince uh, you know, economies one more time that international trade is the engine of economic growth. And I think uh, ex- there are ec- economic literature is full of these arguments. I'm not making anything new, which uh, you cannot see in the existing literature. But the uh, free trade has helped economies to uh, uh, prosper very. very quickly india is a classic example after 1990 uh, china is another good example that trade has become a very beneficial so world trade organization has to take out all of these uh, protest protectionist uh, forces that are abundant in the world now and uh, somehow convince the economies because if you want to go to the back to the old normal the old normal was that china showed a tremendous growth in 30 years india showed a tremendous growth in 30 35 years so um, as to 1990 and onwards now all these growth stories are a direct result of opening the economies rather than closing them so protectionism is not going to take uh, economies anywhere uh, free trade is probably a um, um, old normal which help the economy and it, that should be a part of the new normal as well what well, will it come there i really seriously doubt that because as i said more and more economies are getting very suspicious about each other so india china are getting to a point of uh, almost a, uh, a war and uh, that's not very nice for the economic growth yes indeed uh talking about the global economy as a birds i view the global supply chain now disruption trade are imbalancing uh that were already not working in favor of the developing economies adding to it we now have a worldwide fall in the price of commodities which is bound to hurt the export sector and in turn uh, affect the employment and fiscal deficit what are your thoughts on the revival of revenue for the governments Well, I think the re- revival of global economy is again uh, is going to be hard, is going to be long, and it is uh, uh, it is uh, uh, it is going to be very challenging. I I think I think uh, well in twenty seventeen, uh, a co-author of mine, uh, Dr. Penny Prime of Georgia State and I, we uh, wrote a little article which was uh, actually was published in Global. business review in delhi um, and um, in that article we uh, uh, took the four major economies of the world namely us U- us china germany and japan and we showed that uh, all these four economies are uh, slowing down and uh, therefore the um, <clears throat> the idea was that there was there was a global slowing down uh, coming up Uh, and we predicted that in 2017 of course 18 in uh, we were seeing some forces especially in uh, china uh, and in japan and germany not as much in the us uh, but um, well, unfortunately we have been proven uh, right by uh, coronavirus now and i think we are even a whole lot more serious 
contraction in the global economy. Uh, already, we, we are predicting 6% of uh, 7%. IMF just uh, last week, uh, International Monetary Fund uh, just last week predicted there will be a 5% uh, um, contraction in the world economy. And uh, I agree with all those projections. Well, these are, I, I don't think these are projections. These are the facts. Uh, the fact is that in 2020, uh, we are looking at a pretty severe contraction. Yes, indeed. Uh, with the war, ongoing trade war between China and USA, that amplified by the COVID situation also, there have been disruptions in global value chain. How can we rectify like, the issues of the trade war and the war between <laughs> China and <laughs> India? That, that's a million dollar question. How can, how can you revert uh, the friction? between uh, us and china and uh, india and china well uh, I, I think it's it's a it's a better mature economic understanding that will take us there i mean I, even when uh, president uh, trump uh, tried to put a lot of tariffs on china a, a group of economists uh, uh, wrote him a letter that mr president please do not uh, do this uh, because uh, protectionism has not done anything good uh, to the economies before and uh, i was one of the signees so i remember that letter but uh, <clears throat> uh, but the the idea is that the longer we keep doing this worse it's going to get and if you if you don't want that to happen we have to reverse the forces we have to come to some kind of understanding where we have to come to a better uh, transactions uh, between the country uh, and not just uh, india and china but also us and china and almost everybody else because international trade as even Adam Smith and Ricardo would have argued, uh, leads uh, leads to higher efficiency. You international trade is a very important part of uh, global economic growth, and I I think uh, higher efficiency has to be promoted. Our all our policies have to be uh, going in that direction, one way or the other. So the the longer we fight, worse it gets. Worse it gets, sir. Uh, these war trade war, so the tariff war, what we can say, is just majorly related to trade deficit. So obviously, if we have trade, if we are doing some trade, we cannot do trade in terms of the ideology keeping in mind of mercantilism. So there must be some deficit, some must be surplus. So how are large deficits contributing to these tariff wars? Well, I, I think uh, the, the, the danger of a trade deficit sometimes is overblown. Uh, because uh, trade deficit of a consistent on a long term basis and uh, of a significant number is probably disastrous to the economy i i can see that point you can obviously not uh, import all the time more than what you export and have a trade deficit uh, for a very long time because you have to find the ways to pay for all these higher imports but then trade deficit of a short term nature uh, is probably uh, economic welfare enhancing activity because all it means is that you are getting more imports and if let's say your imports uh, consist of a lot of raw materials then having a lot of imported raw materials which will enable you to produce output in the economy that is all uh, good for the economic growth this type of trade deficit is uh, good in fact one can also argue that some trade deficit is a welfare enhancing activity because let's say you go out for shopping in paris of course you spend some money you create a small amount of uh, deficit for the indian in case of you it will be india in case of me it will be a deficit in the u.s uh, trade balance and both of us when we shop in paris of course that is welfare enhancing activity i think that's a good thing for our economic welfare. Uh, one last question, sir. Uh, people are saying companies are moving out of China due to high labor costs, some issues, and other things. The opportunity for developing countries like Vietnam, Bangladesh, India. So, what do you think is is it a reality that companies are moving after investing huge amount of dollars, like billions of dollars in China? Is it a feasible? Some small companies. Are moving? I, I think that's a very good question. I, I, I think it is a question which uh, uh, I don't have a complete answer for. But um, but if China keeps doing these uh, so-called suspicious activities, uh, not giving enough information to the people, and that is a, that is a part and parcel of uh, efficiency of the product, that keeping it transparent 
uh, information and uh, allowing people to know how and why they prosper in China. It is all important part. I think information is an important part of any product. And therefore, if China continues to do this, of course, companies will leave for a right reason from, from them. But that doesn't mean uh, the end of the world. There will be another China. India could be the candidate for it. Um, but there could be any other uh, country which will invite uh, the foreign direct investment and have, uh, again, uh, keep in mind that they don't want to make the mistakes like China did uh, and uh, give uh, and invite the foreign direct investment for the right reasons. Then, uh, then of course, there is, there, is a, there is a chance and there is a hope uh, that all these companies who will suffer uh, in China uh, get out of China and go somewhere else. Because if you, China's behavior clearly is uh, questionable. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much, sir, for coming to our show. And one last, uh, I would like to ask some few words of encouragement for ecoholics. Well, actually, uh, when when you uh, invited me, um, um, staying in the U.S. for such a long time, and I've been here for 44 years now. I left uh, my hometown, Pune, in 1976, and uh, as a young man to, who came to do PhD in the U.S., and I have just stayed along here for 44 years. So, uh, but India has been a uh, my my love, and I always watch. Uh, Indian economic growth, and I write quite a bit on India too. So uh, clearly, uh, it is uh, my uh, so-called Janma Bhumi, and uh, and therefore I, I pay very careful attention. When you contacted me first, uh, I was uh, intrigued by uh, your uh, association, and uh, once I got more into uh, detail in it, I was uh, extremely impressed by what you you guys are doing and. Uh, Econoholics is a, is a very good association. In fact, uh, I wish I, when I was young, uh, it was a big struggle in those days even to take the GRE uh, because we, yes. the GRE was uh, given only in four centers in India that time. So we had to go to Mumbai to take our GRE and even the TOEFL, the, another test that we had to take. Uh, at that time, I wish uh, we had some something like Econoholics uh, uh, to help us uh, guide our route uh, because we had absolutely no idea how to do this. Now, besides uh, helping uh, students to go to foreign uh, countries to get higher education, you are doing a wonderful job of uh, Indian Economic Service Readiness and all other tests, the IAS uh, readiness and all. So that that information is extremely important for young men and women, uh, <clears throat> men and women in uh, in India, I wish we had that. In fact, just between you and me, don't tell anybody else uh, that I did take uh, Indian Economic Service when I was young. I was doing my uh, institute, and at that time, all we could do is just look at the old test of Indian Economic Service and uh, study from those old questions. So, uh, yeah. as a matter of fact, I was not feeling very good. I had a little fever when I took IES and did not get selected. But uh, but I wish I, I had somebody like you uh, to guide me through that process uh, or your organization. So, so you are doing a tremendous job. And I think uh, all uh, young men and women in uh, India will thank you for that. Uh, so I, I wish uh, you uh, not only a very good, prosperous future, uh, but also keep on doing what what you are doing. I think it's it's a very important, uh, necessary, productive uh, activity, and I wish you the best uh, for for the future. Thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful and kind words. Uh, because Thinking Trees are initiative of Economics Foundation. It's a not for profit initiative to promote real education of economics. So just not the Oxford University or any other fake news that are creating. So get the uh, correct understanding of economics. That's the main well, thing. Uh, one of my uh, very favorite economists, Arthur Lewis, uh, the Nobel Prize winner from Princeton. Yes. Um, well, Arthur Lewis has a very famous quotation uh, when he talks about uh, the uh, history of economic growth or the theory of economic growth. He always mentions that uh, education is a very, very important sector for uh, economic growth and uh, he is famous for saying that the real education may not happen in the classroom 
it happens outside the classroom in entrepreneurship uh, and in uh, internships and uh, in apprenticeship so i i think what you are doing is that you are actually promoting this education outside the classroom and uh, that's wonderful i think that that's a very good thing you are you are doing. and i i bless you for that thank you thank you so much for your blessing sir thank you for coming to our show once again it's a very nice and informative discussion and an eye opening discussion to understand the global economy from well, the thank you for, again thank you for having me if anybody has any question they can always contact me by going to my personal website which is uh, www.kulkarnibooks.com and uh, they can uh, there is a contact information there so they can ask any kind of questions that they have about this very good uh, i have already recommended a lot of books of you related to monetary macroeconomics to my students okay well very okay. good thank you